Welcome to Dig, a history podcast. The dominant narrative, and the story that many of you expect to hear today, is that fat miss used to be less stigmatized, that plump women were beautiful and plump men regarded as wealthy and important, but that somewhere along the way, thinness became associated with beauty and fatness became medicalized as obesity and stigmatized as disgusting, leading to today's skinny-loving, fat-phobic culture. There are, of course, elements of truth to this story, but it's also way more complex than this. What makes it doubly complex is that we don't all agree about the status of fatness today. So even if we could agree on its history, we have very different ideas about where that history ends. Medical folks might point to climbing obesity rates and the impact of overweight and obesity on adverse health outcomes. They might urge obese and overweight people to manage their weight to improve their health. Fat activists might point out that the scholarship connecting fatness with poor health outcomes is incredibly flawed, and that we know much less about fatness and its relationship to health and longevity than we like to admit. They also might claim that bias against fat people does more damage to their health than their actual fatness. Fitness gurus, health grifters, and lifelong dieters might point to how much better they feel when they're thin and how much more approving society is of their thinner selves. They may have even improved their blood work or reversed their diabetes. Don't you want that for yourselves? Does anything really taste as good as thinness feels? Intersectional feminists and Black, queer, Indigenous, and disabled activists might point out, rightly so, that weight stigma is inherently ableist, heteronormative, and racist. Cue the traditionalists and hardcore anti-woke crusaders rolling their eyes at this. So if we can't even sort out how society feels about fatness now, what hope do we have of sorting out historical attitudes toward fatness? Good point. But we're going to try even if it takes us two episodes to do it. This week for our Complexity series, we're covering the complex history of fatness in the pre-modern West. I'm Marissa. And I'm Avril. And we are your historians for this episode of Dig. We want to thank all of our Patreon supporters, and especially our fabulous Augur and Excavator-level patrons, Carl, Hannah, Lauren, Colin, Edward, Iris, Susan, Denise, Agnes, Jesse, Karen, Maria, and Audrey. We can't thank you all enough. Listener, if you're not yet a patron of this show, it's easy. Just go to patreon.com slash digpodcast to learn more. This week, I relied on the hard work of other scholars. It's important that we recognize the blood, sweat, and tears that they put into this scholarship. I'm just synthesizing their words for general audiences. First and foremost, there's historian Christopher E. Forth, who wrote Fat, A Cultural History of the Stuff of Life. This was by far my favorite of all the works I read because of its theoretical complexity. I'm a theory gal, but I won't subject y'all to too much. But I also owe a debt to sociologists Sabrina Strings, historians Sandra Gilman, and Peter Stearns, and many more that you can find in the show notes. Some of these scholars and more will make an appearance in this episode's counterpart, History of Thin, which will come out in November and pick up where this episode leaves off. We also want to clarify that we chose to use the term fat rather than any other term to describe fat bodies because that's the term used to describe them in almost all the periods included here. Plus, fat activists prefer the term for reasons that we'll get into in the History of Thin episode. Okay, so ancient people's attitudes toward fatness are not easy to categorize. 
fatness could mean different things depending on the social status of the person that it belonged to. For example, ancient Egyptians idealized slim bodies for women and muscled bodies for men. But mummified remains suggest that wealthy Egyptians were often obese, even by today's standards, at the time of their deaths. Queen Hatshepsut, for example, was described by anthropologists as having been, quote, hugely obese, based on her remains. Some pharaohs were depicted realistically as old and overweight in their tomb art, suggesting that fatness did not damage their power or reputation. There's plenty of evidence that the ancient Greeks and Romans were disgusted by fat people. Rufus of Ephesus urged mothers to monitor their daughters' bodies for signs of unsightly fatness. Serranus claimed that frequent coitus was a great way for women to remain slim. A lack of sex led to weight gain and lethargy. Serranus of Ephesus felt that fatness was characterized by, quote, an abnormal and excessive amount of flesh, which bulges out in full prominence. He described this disorder as unsightly and disgraceful. A fat person was, he argued, liable to be suffocated by his own body. Serranus compared people with excessive flesh to livestock who were force fed in their stalls so that their bodies became large and bulky and puffed up. But the ancients discussed with fatness could be overcome by other qualities. Socrates, for instance, was beloved by his students despite his corpulence and ugliness. Occasionally, his students made jokes about his fatness, but they resemble good-natured ribbing, as if Socrates was in on the joke. Indeed, most of them agreed that Socrates had a beautiful mind. When he was persecuted by the state for his dangerous ideas— not one surviving criticism of the philosopher used his fatness or ugliness against him. This notion of balance makes sense because Greek classical tradition valued moderation in all things. The Romans, at least in theory, adopted moderation as a virtue. The Roman physician Galen recommended that people pursue a body mass that was, quote, midway between thin and corpulent. Likewise, Encyclopedist Celsus wrote, Quote, the square-built frame, neither thin nor fat, is the fittest. For tallness, as it is graceful in youth, shrinks in the fullness of age. A thin frame is weak, a fat one sluggish. Celsus acknowledged that some people tended toward slimness, while others tended toward obesity. His word, not ours. But he recommended that people overcome their natural inclinations by adopting habits that gently and moderately counteracted their body's preferred state. Marshall, our Roman friend from our episode about swearing, wrote the following. Quote, I don't want a slender girlfriend whose arms would be encircled by my rings, who would shade me with her bare haunch and prick me with her knee who has a saw projecting from her loins and a spearhead from her arse. But neither do I want a girlfriend weighing a thousand pounds. I'm a flesh fancier, not a fat fancier. End quote. And now you're all wondering why, Marissa and Avril, must you always bring sex into it? <laughs> um, <laughs> this time we're just following the Greeks lead. The Greeks saw the appetites of the stomach as intimately connected to sexual appetite. And the ideal sexual appetite was, you guessed it, moderate. This is one of the reasons why idealized Greek statues typically have small penises. Too large a penis might indicate that the figure was oversexed or debauched. But too far in the other direction was also unsuitable. Epaminondas, a general from Thebes, bemoaned the fatness of some of his soldiers. Quote, three or four shields would scarcely serve to protect his belly, because of which he could not see a thing below it. <laughs> End quote. Modern people might believe that by this, Epaminondas was referring to the soldiers' feet. But experts are almost certain he has a sneaky implication that they were effeminate and unmanly because of their fatty softness. The feminizing function of fat in the ancient world is also apparent in ancient depictions of slaves who were portrayed as fat, shapeless, unmanly, and ugly. So it's possible that in the ancient world, at least in the later Roman period that revolved around strength and virility, men were particularly vulnerable to anti-fat attitudes. 
Roman Emperor Aurus Vitellius, disgraced after losing a civil war with his rival, was lambasted by contemporaries such as Tacitus, who said he was a, quote, slave to his stomach and had sold himself to luxury, end quote. Cassius Dio wrote that Vitellius, quote, was insatiate in gorging himself and was constantly vomiting up what he ate, being nourished by the mere passage of the food, and that his appetite was insatiable, coarse, and constant. He could not hold it in check, even when he was conducting a sacrifice or traveling, end quote. As Vitellius met his ignominious death in Rome's streets, citizens berated him for his fatness and his gluttony. As antiquity progressed, it appears as if Romans were less tolerant of the lack of self-mastery that was evident in Vitellius's fatness. His weight was used as additional evidence against him for his other crimes. At the same time, a competent and beloved leader could be overweight and their fatness could be rendered as evidence of their virility and power. Fatness also played into Greeks and Romans' perceptions of themselves as compared to foreigners. Following their extensive interactions with Asian cultures, namely the Persians, Greeks and Romans incorporated fatness into their prejudices against the Orient. Preferring to understand themselves as the most virtuous cultures, Greeks and Romans criticized the Orient's wealth and luxury, describing Asians as, quote, reclining on costly couches at costly tables, delivering themselves into the hands of servants and cooks to be fattened in the dark like voracious animals, and ruining not only their characters, but also their bodies by surrendering them to every desire and all sorts of surefit, which call for long sleeps, hot baths, abundant rest, and, as it were, Daily nursing and tending. I mean, long sleeps and hot baths and abundant rest. Sounds, Sounds kind of good. Freaking great. <laughs> Sign me up. As Oriental culture spread into the Mediterranean, the Greeks and Romans lamented its softening of their own culture. Greeks and Romans hearkened back to the strict regimes of classical Sparta as a founding Mediterranean ethos that had been mutated and damaged by Oriental luxury. This, of course, was just wishful thinking. Few Romans, or even Greeks for that matter, met the Spartan standards. Luxury and debauchery were homegrown problems, but that went unacknowledged. Soft bodies had to become, therefore, the primary evidence of a decline in the quality of the people inhabiting the Hellenized world. And if you remember our Fall of Rome episode, you might recall that for centuries, historians took Romans at their word on this, arguing that the Fall of Rome was attributed to the degradation of strong Roman stock. They got all soft and wussy, and that's why Rome fell. <laughs> so as the Christian church solidified its hold on the remnants of the Hellenized world, fatness became part of the tension between old pagan Rome and growing Christendom. Christians weaponized the old Roman ideas about Oriental luxury against Roman pagans, casting themselves, Christians, as the morally upright heroes of the ancient world. It was the Christians, with their sexual and culinary abstinence, who survived the fall of Rome, which had abandoned itself to gluttony and debauchery. A good case study is the Roman Emperor Galerius, who uh, ruled from 305 to 311 CE, whose impressive fatness and largeness was portrayed as evidence of his power and strength by pagan authors. In the growing Christian world, however, his fatness was wielded as proof that he was gluttonous, unwell, and animalistic. Roman Christian Lucius Cacilius Lactantius, advisor to the Christian Emperor Constantine, wrote that Galerius was, quote, a beast with a natural barbarity and wildness quite foreign to Roman blood. His body matched his character. He was tall in stature, and the vast expanse of his flesh was spread and bloated to a horrifying size, end quote. Leaning into this line of thinking, the Roman Catholic Church tended to glorify thinness over fatness or even moderation because hunger and thinness represented self-sacrifice, submission to God, and rejection of worldly desires in favor of godly ones. Despite its self-congratulations in these matters, the Roman Catholic Church borrowed this idea from the Hebrews as well as from the Roman Neoplatonists, like Porphyry, who wrote, quote, When the body is fattened, it starves the soul of the blessed life and enlarges the mortal part. 
distracting and obstructing the soul on its way to immortal life, and it stains the soul by incarnating it and dragging it down to that which is alien. Here, the Roman Catholic Church borrowed Plato's philosophy of mind-body dualism, the idea that the mind or the soul in the Christian context and the body are two separate entities. The body is part of the, of the lowly material world, while the mind or soul is part of a higher order or reality. One can, however, be corrupted by the other. Uh, the 4th century theologian Gregory of Nazianzus explains the benefits of self-restraint, writing that he was happy, quote, not to have my body swollen with things filling it inside, sick with the infirmity of the wealthy, breathing from my throat the sickly sweet odor of filth, constraining my mind with the weight of my fat. Sounds pretty fat phobic, huh? <laughs> yeah, it sounds pretty sad. I know. So we already covered how ancient Greeks and Romans held fatness in contempt and even likened fat people to livestock. Christendom built on this framework of contempt and dehumanization and added layers of sin, spiritual corruption, and moral failing. Tertullian even went so far as to argue that slim people could more easily go to heaven, quote, more easily through the straight gate of salvation will slender flesh enter, more speedily will lighter flesh rise, longer in the sepulcher will drier flesh retain its firmness, end quote. Early church father John Chrysostom demonstrates this anti-fat bulwark quite well. He wrote about a man who appeared, quote, as if he were indeed a hog and fattening, and calls him a spectacle of unseemliness with nothing human about him, but with all the appearance of a beast with a human shape. But he continues, the miserable soul, just like the lame, is unable to rise, bearing about its bulk of flesh like an elephant, end quote. This Christian disdain for fatness was perhaps unsurprisingly gendered. Chrysostom was especially critical of fat women. For example, he claimed, quote, In truth, luxury makes the beautiful woman not only sickly, but also foul to look upon. He continues saying that a fat woman is, quote, continually sending forth unpleasant exhalations and breathes fumes of stale wine and is more florid than she ought to be and spoils the symmetry that beseems a woman and loses all her seemliness and her body becomes flabby her eyelids bloodshot and distended and her bulk unduly great and her flesh a useless load end quote i roll Lest we accuse Chrysostom of superficiality, he is sometimes careful to couch his criticisms in terms of health, as if his concern is for women themselves, writing, quote, For why dost thou, O woman, continually enfeeble thy body with luxury and exhaust it? Why dost thou ruin thy strength with fat? This fat is flabbiness, not strength. <laughs> Thank God we have Chrysostom here to... Mm monitor our health. <laughs> but medieval Christendom wasn't all doom and gloom for fat people, at least wealthy ones. Obviously, um, based on the sources we've just quoted, medieval Christians associated fatness with luxury. And there was good reason for this. Most medieval people were living an on a subsistence diet. Malnutrition was common and manual labor was demanding, so commoners rarely achieved a level of corpulence that one would call fat. Still, their bodies differed tremendously in size, shape, and body fat percentage, as bodies do. Um, but commoners generally had more immediate challenges to their bodies than carrying excess weight. Overeating, or, or feasting as it might have been referred to, was often balanced with lean periods of famine. In this environment, bodily fat increased the likelihood of survival during periodic bouts of near starvation. Consequently, fatness and thinness became even more than they had been, markers of economic inequality. This complexified the role of fatness in medieval society. Fatness was achievable or even common for a select few. Who could afford to abstain from manual labor and at the same time dine on rich caloric food and drink? Fancy people! In other words, royalty, lords, gentry, religious elites, and perhaps the occasional merchant. Medieval cooking did not require many fats or sugars, so before 1600, medieval elites would fatten themselves on wine, meat, and refined breads only. 
In one sense, fat men were to be envied, beloved, and admired. They were men of means, typically powerful in their communities and folks who were seeking out their favor. As much as social mobility was possible in the medieval world, it was, but it was rare, the fat man was the pinnacle of achievement. Fat men could afford higher quality food, which they could eat until they were full and maybe even past comfortable fullness. Warriors were especially afforded a pass on gluttony since massive amounts of food were assumed to be necessary to maintain their strength. Fatness might indicate wealth, nobility, or strength. The rules may have been a little different for royalty as well. For example, French King Louis VI became so fat during his reign that he was unable to mount his horse. One strike against him. Still, his contemporaries claimed he was also very tall, strong, and physically active. He was also a warrior king. During one campaign, Louis was said to have summoned amazing zeal and, despite the weight of his body, led his host across steep slopes and along paths blocked by woods, paying no regard to the danger. While records suggest Louis died from dysentery, chroniclers blamed his death on his corpulence, writing, quote, The weight of his fleshy body and the toil of endless tasks had quite beaten down the Lord King Louis, end quote. Louis' French-born biographer dubbed him Louis the Glorious, but after his death, his political enemies and English chroniclers renamed him Louis the Fat. <laughs> Indeed, fatness was not entirely unproblematic. Fat clergy were particularly vulnerable to criticism. Their fatness was doubly offensive, given its association with sin. Sometimes fat clergy were deployed as evidence of clerical corruption and vice in medieval and early modern society. For example, German chroniclers wrote about a monk named Aldebaro living in a monastery in the bishopric of Worms. Aldebaro was incredibly fat as well as disabled. The chroniclers referred to him as completely lame in one foot. Lampert of Hersefeld writes that Aldebaro was, quote, in all respects, a sight to behold, for he was a man of great strength, of extreme gluttony, and of such great fatness that he struck beholders with horror rather than admiration. No hundred-handed giant or any other monster of antiquity, if it rose from the underworld, would turn the eye and gaze of the astonished populace upon himself to this degree. By comparing Aldebaro to monstrosities, Lampert is rendering Aldebaro's fatness as a disfigurement of his own making, outward evidence of his inward vileness. Aldebaro is a good example of the degree to which corpulence was admired. Some fatness was okay, but a lot of fatness, or fatness matched with disability, was socially unacceptable. The key was to be strong, quote-unquote able-bodied, and slightly fat. Fatness that hindered movement made men effeminate and made warriors unfit for service. This is a point that bears repeating when it comes to women in the Renaissance. Popular histories often point to the relative corpulence of women in Renaissance paintings, arguing that it's evidence of a higher level of acceptance for fatness. But it's just not that simple. 12th century French author Matthew of Vendôme described Helen of Troy's body, purportedly the late medieval ideal, writing that her body, quote, narrowed at her waist up to the place where the luscious little belly arises that does not shake with flabby flesh. Ideal early modern women were, indeed, thicker than the very thin women who became the pinnacle of beauty in the later 20th century. But they were far from fat. They had small waists and dainty hands and feet. Given the nutritional standards of the time, they were likely smaller than most women today. They were certainly softer, less lean, and less muscular than the ancient ideal, and definitely not super thin like the Twiggies and Kate Mosses of the 20th century. Still, around the time of the Renaissance, so 13th, 14th century Italy, something changed. In 1304, Giotto di Bondone painted one of the first artistic depictions of a very fat person in his wedding at Cana. It was hardly a positive representation. The fat wine steward depicted in the image is greedily swigging from a jug of wine, and he looks somewhat absurd in comparison to the rest of the thin, well-behaved guests. Most Renaissance representations of nude bodies, and there's a lot of them, 
depict people who are perhaps more fleshy than super slim, but they would not have been considered fat at the time and probably would not be considered so today. Although, I have to say, um, I questioned that a little because I saw tons of negative comments, and you probably did too, Avril, about Tina Cuerta, or the actor who played um, Namor. Mm-hmm. in Black Panther Wakanda Forever. Mm-hmm. I thought he was a lovely specimen. Um, but like a lot of people were like, oh, he's so fat, I guess. Isn't that f- weird? Yeah. Um, so I say they wouldn't be considered fat today, but take that with a grain of salt. Some people might consider those people to be quote unquote fat. Mm-hmm. Back to the Renaissance uh, for a minute. Even uh, Peter Paul Rubens, who was known for depicting fleshy women, did not describe the feminine ideal as particularly fat. According to historian Christopher Forth, Rubens asserted that, quote, even if fleshier by nature, the female should nevertheless display moderation in all her aspects, being neither too thin nor too scrawny, neither too big nor too fat, but a moderate embonpoint, according to the model of antique statues. Rubens thus maintained that a woman's hips and thighs should be large and ample, her breasts smoothly separated so they project moderately from the chest. The skin of her stomach should not be loose, nor should the stomach sag, but should be soft and with a smooth and flowing contour. The primary goal of the Rubenesque paintings of the Renaissance were to depict women in as feminine a way as possible, avoiding any qualities that could be construed with masculinity, such as musculature or athleticism. Rubens says forth, Quote, explain that female proportions would ideally be weaker and smaller, for when it comes to the perfection of forms, woman holds the second rung after man. End quote. So far from some kind of feminist utopia free from fat phobia, um, the Renaissance was an incredibly sexist time. When fleshiness was prescribed for women, it was in the interest of enforcing stricter gender norms and not as some kind of kindness to fat bodies. And this is not to say that fatness was bad, per se, to the Renaissance mind. Early modern authors, in contradiction to medieval and classical authors, regarded luxury in new and exciting ways. Rather than viewing pleasure and luxury as sinful, as a foreign oriental import, Or as an affront to self-mastery, early modern writers began to conceive of pleasure as a necessary ingredient to emotional well-being. Consequently, early modern authors depicted fatness as a bodily state associated with wealth and happiness. Early modern physicians and surgeons reinforced this association. Laurent Joubert, for example, wrote that, quote, slender people who are by nature choleric, Um, And that's referring to people who have too much yellow bile. They tend to be angry and and nasty Um, when they give themselves up to rest without worry and without sadness. And if they eat well and take good care of themselves, easily become fat and lose their natural slenderness, end quote. So he's kind of saying that in this case, like the fatness is the is the cure, you know. This new association with worldly pleasures and human happiness did not emancipate early modern people from anti-fat attitudes. It's not entirely a contradiction since in the late 1600s and early 1700s, people began to seriously doubt whether one could be both intelligent and happy. A line in Thomas Gray's 1742 poem, Ode on a Distant Prospect of Eton College, spoke to this phenomenon. Quote, where ignorance is bliss, tis folly to be wise. Fatness was, in the end, perceived to be the result of intemperate behavior, and intemperate behavior was a sign of laziness, carelessness, or ignorance. That's why it was compatible with happiness. Fourth lays out this binary really well. So he writes, quote, so was it better to be fat and happy? and risk being perceived as a coarse, lazy, and stupid sensualist, or lean and hungry, but potentially more refined, clever, and industrious, end quote. Understanding this tension is critical to studying fatness in the 18th century and beyond. Think of the 18th century as the big bang of the fitness industrial complex. The dawn of modernity, capitalism, industrialism, consumerism, mass media, the public's fear, 
unprecedented political strife, a populace enthralled to the caprices of beauty and fashion industries, and the first appearance of the cult of thinness. So there is still so much story to tell about the history of fatness, but given the extreme complexity of the issue and our desire to do the modern era justice, we're going to end this episode here. We're going to pick up where we left off with this episode's counterpart, The History of Thin, which will focus on fatness in a thin-centric modern world. And it'll be part of our next series coming out in November, so stay tuned. Thanks for joining us today. We invite you to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at dig underscore history, or join our Facebook group, Dig History Pod Squad, for all kinds of memes and historian hijinks. If you have a comment or question or want to share some kind words with us, you can always email us at hello at digpodcast.org. We love listener mail. If you're an educator, we've got a compendium of, of episodes you can use in the classroom and free teaching resources, including full lesson plans, on our website, digpodcast.org. You'll also find full bibliographies and scripts for all of our episodes, resources, and a link to our swag store at digpodcast.org. Bye. Bye. And bon point. Is that a real f-ing word? I don't know. I don't know. I don't remember that word being in there, but I copied and pasted it right from... Why are you making that face? Oh, apparently it's a uh, part of a woman's bosoms. We want to... Th- <clears throat> Whoa, we want a th- frog jumped in your throat. A frog does, because I woke up like 25 minutes ago. <laughs> I just have to wait for the baby to go away. Sorry. More speedily will lighter fresh rise. Or... Er, bl- it's a knock on fat soldiers, a squeaky, impl- in, what about, a squeaky, sneaky. sneaky. <laughs> well, I don't know where squeaky came from. <laughs> the pinnacle of beauty in the later 20th century. <laughs> Listener, Marissa wrote the 30th century, so she's already living in the future. <laughs> yes, okay. okay in the later 20th, <laughs> for depicting be- the little, 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 little. Zanias, Zan- Nazianzus. Nazianz. Nazi Anz. Nazi Anus. Nazi Anzus. Uh oh, what was the real one?